Hi, and welcome to the post-mortem presentation for Block and Tackle. This game was developed by our team of six Full Sail students as our final project for the game design program. We are myself, Chris George, Lindsay Beaver, James Hale, Gerald Skelton, Howard Waldrop, and Andy Young. The original vision for Block and Tackle was to create a character-focused action platformer that allowed the player to use two unique characters to solve puzzles and defeat enemies. While we achieved this vision in a number of ways, such as creating interesting character art, several issues that arose during development caused us to fall short in some other regards. The key issues were finding the appropriate scope for the game given our limited time and resources, and overcoming technical hurdles we ran into during developing our features. My teammates will now tell you about some of the successes and challenges we experienced. The development of our game took many twists and turns over the course of the past four months. Throughout the development of Block and Tackle, we faced many programming hurdles that took longer than expected to be worked out. We lost a great amount of time along the way dealing with things that ultimately didn't even make it to our game, as well as things that are featured in the game. This unfortunate loss of valuable time on unused concepts, mechanics, double working on several areas, only to throw it all away, was a very unfortunate blow to our game and proved to be organized chaos at times. What should have taken days to complete often unfortunately took weeks, and after a while seemed to prove frustrating to many members of the team. Our problems began early on into the project when we could not get a side-scrolling camera to function as we intended. With no working camera, the ability to work on other things was hindered immediately. After some experimenting, we were able to get the camera working and moved on to our next obstacle, getting two playable pawns to spawn simultaneously. After several attempts, we were able to get this mechanic working, but ran into yet another obstacle with our camera which had to be torn apart and rebuilt from scratch. Once these things were fixed, we ran into numerous instances where work was put in for weeks at a time on several features of our game, only to be thrown out for various reasons. Ultimately, the technical hurdles we faced throughout the development of the game resulted in the scope of our project being scaled back as many things were deemed unusable or just did not work in the time frame we had laid before us. The things that we lost and gained along the way formed our game into what it is today. Hello, this is Lindsay Beaver. I'm one of the designers on Block and Tackle. I'm going to be talking about some of the mechanics that we used and some of the challenges that we face while learning a lot of new things. So one of the things that worked really well in the techniques that we put into place was trying to turn our conceptual mechanics into actual technical code, uh, making UDK kind of do things that it wasn't necessarily meant to do, specifically with a platformer. Uh, we used uh, one of our core mechanics was this hunker down uh, concept where block would basically drop down and, and turn into a box that tackle could then jump on. So getting that working was both a, an interesting learning experience but also one of the bigger challenges that we had. It uh, kind of slowed us down for a while. So as we see in some of these pictures here, the first thing we did was have a, a box spawn at block's location. That was something that tackle could then jump on. Um, but, and then making that simply disappear and not be visible. There were some physics challenges and other problems with that that we finally overcame. And then at the advice and feedback in a, a couple of weeks in, we ended up turning that into a soft platforming process whereby Tackle could actually run through Block while he was hunkered down, um, hunkered down even though the box was present. But when he leapt above him, then the box came into play. And you'll see that in some of the, the demo gameplay. Uh, a lot of skills that, that I learned and found useful was really getting into the code and, like I said, making UDK do some really interesting things. It did end us end up having us spin our wheels a lot. There was a lot of downtime trying to get some of these you know finicky things working, and but in the end, it, it provided the opportunity to make the, the game do some of the interesting things that we wanted it to do. Uh, while that's while none of this is perfect, it was a, a great learning opportunity to really kind of get in there and do some some complicated code. And uh, you see that, that mechanic used in essentially every level we've got. Art-wise, we had a pretty specific vision in mind. We discussed it and we uh, drew, up, drew up relatively quickly some pretty good convincing concept art. We had a pretty good start to our concept art. It's very well detailed. Um, but we did run into some issues. Basically, we had this vision that we wanted to create this 2D game using flat 2D art. Um, but using UDK, we really weren't able to figure out exactly how we could implement that well. Um, we did know how to do the 2D part of it, but just getting it to be flat art, um, similar to the art used, for example, in certain segments of Alice Madness Returns, where you, uh, you have flat art, 
moving around in this 3D environment, and that's kind of like the 2D, 3D thing we, I think we ultimately wanted to go with, but we just weren't able to really get that working the way we wanted to. Uh, we also ran into some issues using scale form. All of our menus, we wanted to do custom menus, but we wanted to have some menus that kind of match the art that we originally established, the, the art style. And just trying to implement scale form using Flash was relatively difficult just because there's so many different ways to do it and ultimately ended up being an easier way that worked for us. And I, I think that maybe had we understood how to use scale form and apply it better at the beginning of our project, we may have been able to utilize scale form better to actually create the project we want to begin with using 2D and UDK. Ultimately, we did you know, use some existing resources from Jazz Jackrabbit to get our environments to match the cartoony kind of steel, style that we wanted. Uh, for the project, but I believe that probably the really big downfall that we have are just our character models just really stood out as a sore thumb, using a robot and a, and a hunk soldier instead. I think if we would have been able to get some character models that match the concept art that we have from the beginning, you know, having an artist on board to do that would have really helped kick this uh, project in, 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 in gear. But overall, I think that we were able to achieve most of our goals, and who knows, maybe we can revisit it at some point in the future and get those models in. Hi there. My name is Gerald Skelton, and I was a member of the development team for Block and Tackle. During our time working on this project, we had a lot of ups and a few downs, but I think that we managed to bring together a really fun idea. I was working mainly with two levels in the game, level 2, the ship's upper deck, and level 3, shipwreck. I had a lot of fun working on these levels, but what took the longest for me was not building them, but it was actually trying to come up with fun and interesting puzzles that weren't too challenging or beyond my own ability to create. Simplicity was what I really tried to focus on, almost to a fault in my opinion. I might have made 2 and 3 a little bit too simple, but what what is done is done, and that game is as polished as it can be with the time given. Working with UDK Kismet was pretty great. It really helped to simplify the task of making a game like ours, uh, just from start to finish in 3 months. But limitations that can really hinder you with working with Kismet, however, it's not understanding how to create your own nodes, uh, or using most of the existing nodes and how they behave exactly. Uh, now, level 2 I think was really cool because the level itself is set in a foggy night and you can just barely see a little island off in the distance. It's a little bit of foreshadowing on my part and I'm really glad that UDK had the existing resources to make this level come together. I actually built the entire ship from BSP brushes and a few static meshes that were originally intended for use as more of radio antenna and an electrical tower, I think. And I just retextured them, actually rematerialed them with wood paneling to give them that shippy look. That's pretty much the beauty of world building, I guess, though. Building an entire world from nothing and creating enough wonder and excitement to keep your player going. Not just for the gameplay, but hopefully for the scenery as well. Level 3 was where I went kind of overboard with world building and not really puzzle design. The ships in the level are made from doorway arches and BSP brushes which just are set with a wood paneling material to give it that ship feel. Uh, I really like the, the idea of walking through wrecked ships on an island in the middle of the ocean somewhere. I thought that the setting really helped to bring together the game's character and a little bit of the theme better. Thanks for listening, and now on to another one of my teammates. Hello, my name is Howard Waldrop, and I'm going to discuss the development cycle of Block and Tackle's enemy NPCs and their AI systems. When we first designed Block and Tackle, we had created four enemy AI types to use throughout the game. These types were tavern patrons, which threw glass mugs as projectiles. Next, we designed pirates that would shoot cannonballs at the player, followed by crabs that would follow a set path for the player to either kill or avoid. And bringing up the rear of this AI quartet was a monkey AI that would sit on top of a tree and throw coconuts at the player that they would have to avoid. Each of these four enemies required four scripts, the main definition script, the controller script, a custom weapon script, and a projectile script. As the block and tackle development cycle steamed ahead, I spent countless hours learning Unreal Script to a point where I could code all of the behavior of these enemies from scratch and have them look and feel natural on screen. Just when I had all four enemies optimized in their performance, we had to make the tough decision to scrap the enemy AI altogether. This decision was made because the enemies no longer fit in the ever-shifting design of the Block and Tackle game. Block and Tackle had shifted from an action-adventure platform game to a puzzle-based level traversal game. At this point, the enemy AI started to feel like they were just there to be there. 
Uh, basically, they were forced. So ultimately, we decided to drop the AI and focus on level traversal, which freed up countless man hours and allowed our team to focus more on gameplay and the player experience from moment to moment. The final level in Block and Tackle, also the most difficult, had a few challenges to overcome throughout its development cycle. The first major hurdle was that Block could not die, as he is a possessed pawn and not the actual player. The decision was made to change the level design so that Block could no longer die, which eventually led to all levels being about traversal and the ability to die removed almost entirely from the game. There are, however, a couple of spots in the final level where death can still occur, but it is also the only place in the design where it fits the game's feel and tone. Other than removing death from the level, the only real major changes from concept to completion was the addition of character speech pop-ups uh, that were added to give hints as to how to solve the various puzzles. These ended up being liked so well that they were added throughout the entire game. All in all, creating Block and Tackle was a great learning experience for the whole team. Not only did we gain valuable experience as designers working on a complete game project, but we learned several important lessons on creating games, such as when it's necessary to cut features for the good of the project as a whole. We learned that being a game designer requires not only vision, but also the ability to collaborate with others, think on your feet, and work hard to make that vision come to life and change it for the better along the way. And I believe that in doing so, we accomplished something to be proud of that is a worthy culmination of our full sail journey. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thanks for watching.